Okay, good morning. Um, we're going to be back in Hebrews. We're going to start. We're going to go back in chapter 3 um, for a little bit of context. And uh, we're going to be discussing false conversion and apostasy, which are two different things, um, though they're related. But for a little bit of context, we're going to start back in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. And the author of Hebrews writes, For who, having heard, rebelled, indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, <coughs> not being mixed with faith in those who heard. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And we'll stop right there. Really, I went a verse ahead we're going to focus in on verses one and two and one of the things and this is not going to be the totality of the sermon i just want to make note right here going back we made a point the other week that we're justified in time and this verse is it not a clear declaration to that fact since it states that we enter that rest by faith through faith it's not you know it's not christ's faith it's the actual faith that we have that we are given by god that we actually believe we actually have assurance now is that the cause of our justification no but it is the uh if we're going to say it's an instrument that god gives his people whereby he declares one righteous it is a bowl full of righteousness at the moment when god gives it and declares that person righteous but nevertheless it is something that we are not until God gives us faith. We're not born into this world already in that rest. We enter that rest by faith. Now, moving on, um, we're going to talk about uh, different aspects of this passage. We're going to address what is the promise? What is the rest? What is faith? How do faith and promise go together? And what is it to come short of the promise? We're going to address all of these aspects today, this morning. So the author writes here in Hebrews 4, he says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. Now, what, what is the promise? The gospel was first given as a promise. A promise is a statement, it is a declaration by God that he is going to do something. And there, there's different types of promises. Typically promises have conditions. They're, they're bilateral in between two parties. If you do this, I'll do this. The promise of God is not that type of promise as we know. It is not a works-based promise that's conditional upon your obedience. When we read of God's promise, it was first given in Genesis. When God told the serpent that the seed of the woman would crush his head and that he would bruise his heel. And then it was reiterated throughout scripture, that promise, that gospel promise that the seed of the woman was coming to crush the head of the serpent. Uh, when God told Abraham that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. 
And we know that that seed is Christ. And what did the promise state? It stated that by that seed, the nations would be blessed. And that blessing is the rest that God brings that we talked about in Matthew 11 this morning, that it is rest from self-righteousness. It is rest from trying to earn favor before God through your works. It is rest from that because Christ has accomplished salvation for his people. He has blessed the nations through his work. When he came into this world, born as a man, as God incarnate, and perfectly kept the law of God and then died under its curse, under the wrath of God on the tree where the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin and then poured out his wrath on his Son and then the Son of God by the power of his indestructible life satisfied that wrath that those that were given to him deserved to experience in hell. And then he proved as much by raising from the dead three days later. That is the fulfillment of the promise. That through Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He came as the descendant of David. The promise was later reiterated to David that God would sit his descendant upon his throne uh, forever. And now Christ sits on the throne of David ruling and reigning over his people, Israel. Who is Israel? It's those who believe in the fulfilled promise. It is those who believe in the fulfilled promise by the Messiah. That's who Israel is. Israel is not this nation over in the Middle East. We know that the promise was made to Israel. When we read of the new covenant in Scripture, for instance, in Jeremiah 31, God prophesies through Jeremiah and he says, Days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with them in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land. For they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. And then he says, And this is the covenant that I will make with them in those days. I will write my law in their hearts etc., etc., I will be their God and they will be my people. But the point is, is that he made the promise of the new covenant to Israel. And then, so then we have this issue of who is Israel. And we talked about this a few months back when we, uh, we had a sermon on the mystery of the gospel. And we talked about um, who is Israel and what God has done with Israel that when God made the old covenant with Israel, it was addressed to the nation, to the physical nation that was residing in the land. But that old covenant was one of works. It was summarized in the statement, do this and live. And, but it was made to that physical ethnic nation that had descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's how that nation was populated. And that's who God made the old covenant with. But the true Israel, the true descendant of Jacob, who the, that covenant of works was intended for, was Jesus Christ. He came as the true Israel of God, and he fulfilled that covenant. He did that covenant so that his people could live based off of his obedience, based off of his dying. And when he fulfilled that covenant, he made it obsolete. And we read in Deuteronomy, uh, and we read in Acts in Peter's sermon, citing uh, the prophecy that God gave Moses, that days were coming when God would raise up a prophet like Moses from amongst the brethren. And then, and then what did it say in that prophecy? And it shall be that every one that does not hearken unto that prophet shall be destroyed from amongst the people. And so Christ came as that prophet like unto Moses, and he... He confided his ministry, for the most part, to national, ethnic Israel. And he preached the gospel to them. And every ethnic Jew that did not hearken unto that prophet was destroyed from the people. And so then when Christ died on the cross and inaugurated the new covenant by his blood, 
All that was left of physical national Israel was a believing remnant. And who was the new covenant given to? It was given to Israel. But at the time of his death, what was left of Israel? What had Christ did to Israel? He removed ungodliness from Jacob by the preaching of the gospel because he was that prophet like unto Moses. And so then he establishes the new covenant only with those who were believing in the gospel. And then Romans 11 tells us that he grafts in Gentiles, physical Gentiles, into Israel through giving them faith. And so this promise is made to Israel. This promise that the nations would be blessed is made to Israel. And who Israel consists of is a believing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. The promise is for them of rest. And the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, since there remains a promise of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. And so we enter his rest through faith. Through faith. And so now we need to ask the question, what is faith? The rest is that we rest from our self-righteous works to merit God's favor. We're no longer seeking to be justified based off of what we do. Everybody is born into this world thinking that he's a good person. We went, we, we've talked about this several weeks. What our depravity consists of is not merely killing everybody, raping everybody, committing adultery and fornication, but what our, how our depravity chiefly manifests itself is in, in the fact that we think that we're good people and we're not. We want to be seen as righteous by other people. We want to commend ourselves before God. And, and it supremely manifests itself in false religion. In false religion. The religion that says that is basically the same uh, type of religion um, found in, in the Old Covenant. And we know that, that Old Covenant was intended for Christ. But the Old Covenant was a covenant of works. And so every religion that places the condition of acceptance before God upon you is a works-based, self-righteous, false religion, whereby you're continually working and striving to have acceptance with God. But the scripture calls true religion... And we know that Christian, a lot of people say Christianity is not a religion. We know it is a religion. James tells us it's a religion. But what, the, what this true religion is, how it's defined, is that it's rest. It's rest. Meaning you don't do anything to receive it. You don't do anything to maintain it. You don't strive to make God happy with you as the basis of your acceptance. Christ has did it. Christ has blessed the nations. Christ has accomplished his people's rest. And how this is applied to his people is that God converts his people from the mindset of self-righteousness to the mindset of rest. That is the mindset of faith. We and so what is faith? Faith, the author of Hebrews tells us later on in chapter 11, is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So faith is assurance. Assurance is the very essence of faith. And that goes hand in hand with promise, does it not? You know, if I make a promise, I'm going to do this for you. All you can do is be assured that it's going to happen. And that's what God has done. God has made a promise. He's fulfilled that promise by the work of his son. And then he gives his people faith, which is the assurance of that promise being fulfilled 
in the work of his son. And so then his people are confident that it's done for them because he causes them to be. He gives them this gift. He causes them to be born again and receive a heart that is full of faith, that is full of assurance. And if it's full of faith and assurance that the work is finished, then we're not trusting in ourselves. We're not looking at ourselves. We're not worried about the fact that we can lose it or we're not worried about trying to maintain it. We're confident. We're 100% confident. We're 100% assured that we're justified before God because we know that 2,000 years ago he got up from that grave and he rose again demonstrating to everyone publicly that the wrath of God was satisfied. That there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do, as weak as it was, God did. That is our faith. It is what he did. And so when people have faith in each other, if, so, if somebody were to make a promise, like the example I gave a moment, of go, a moment ago, you might be assured that it's going to happen, but you're only assured in as much as that person who made the promise is good for it. And we know him who made the promise. And we know that he cannot deny himself. We know that he is not like a man, that he should change his mind or lie. We know that he keeps his word. We know that he is faithful to keep that which, which we have entrusted to him against that day. And so that is what faith is. Faith is confidence. Faith is assurance. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. What is it to be convicted? That we know. That we... It's, it really goes hand in hand with assurance. With, with confidence. We're convicted that this is so. Even though we don't see it. Even though we didn't see Christ walk this earth. You know, our, our faith is not in signs and wonders. Our faith is in the good news. Our faith is in the report that has been declared to us about what the Messiah has finished, about what he has accomplished. And so we answered, well, how did, we sort of answered how faith and promise go together. And so what is it to come short of the promise? We read, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So he's speaking to those who are in the church. Those who are in the church are those who confess faith. They say, I believe this. And he says, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of the promise. In other words, you're not converted. You're, you're not really a Christian. Now, does that mean that we gaze at ourselves and wonder? No. No. If you have faith, you have faith. If you believe the gospel, you believe the gospel. Is your confidence in your believing of the gospel? No. We believe the gospel. My confidence is in Christ. God-given faith looks away from itself into the substance of faith. But nevertheless, there will be those in the church who profess to believe the gospel, who have come short of the promise. And, and so what does that mean about these people? Well, it means that you have a totally depraved individual who is still unconverted, who still has a heart of stone instead of a heart of flesh. And therefore, we know, because of what Scripture tells us, that that person is still demonstrating himself to be an unbeliever, even though that he says he's a believer. We know that all the things about him are so that the scripture tells us about a totally depraved individual, that he's still trying to earn his righteousness before God. That, and so how has he managed to come inside of the church of God and 
deceive himself into thinking that he believes the truth, which is the opposite of who he is by nature. He believes the lie by nature. He has been begotten by the devil. He has the seed of the devil abiding in him. That is his doctrine. But yet he is making a profession, a false profession, but nevertheless he's still making a profession in the truth. So how has this come to be? And to answer that question, we're going to be looking at some of the parables of Christ. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, we're going to look at two parables. The parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the tares. And we're going to make some distinctions in between these parables. These parables are called by Christ parables of the kingdom. So, and what is the kingdom of God but the church of God, the people of God? Verse 1. On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away, and some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground, and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now for the purpose of this, we're going to uh, go down to the explanation of this parable. In verse 18, therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received uh, seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. All right, so this parable, we're going to make a few notes about this parable. The explanation of it, Jesus tells us that the seed is the word. Now notice in this parable that the seed is never, never different. It's the same seed. So, and it just falls on different types of soil. And so what the difference, what makes the difference is the type of soil that you are. And so some seed, it just falls along the wayside. And the devil comes and he snatches it up. And so that is seed that is sown. And it never produces a crop. Now what is the production of a crop? That is a profession of faith. That's a profession of faith. A crop springs up. You can see it. It's visible. But two of these crops never yield fruit. They never yield fruit. There's only one crop that yields a fruit. And then the first never sprang up. And so that's when the gospel goes forth. The word of God goes forth. And 
that person never makes a profession. He continues to obviously say, I don't believe this. And there's no profession in that person. But for two of these people, there is a profession. But nevertheless, they, they remain false. And so there's two different types of soil here. And both of these soils are what? You don't change what type of, you never change into a good soil here. We don't see that in this parable. You're either a bad soil here, thorny ground and rocky ground, or you're a good soil here. Or to put it another way, you're either elect or you're reprobate. And so that is the context of this. And so the reprobate hearers that, that make a profession in the context of the church, you have first, it says, he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles, which means he falls away. And so this person has made a profession in the truth. And then what causes him to fall away is the fact that he has no root. In other words, he's not really been given faith. He's not grounded in the gospel. He's not been born again. He's not been regenerated and caused to love this truth. And so then when he's attacked for professing this truth, he stumbles. He falls away. The persecution demonstrates that this person is not of God, that this person is reprobate. And persecution causes him to fall away, which means he what? It means he departs from the faith. He departs from the faith. He denies it. He apostatizes. And he demonstrates, his, demonstrates that he is of the devil and he's not of God. Now, the second person is someone who is yet reprobate again. Remember, the seed is the same. This person makes a profession in the gospel. And then what, what happens? Now, he who receives the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. And so what, what, what causes this person to apostatize, to manifest that they're not of God? It's the cares of this world. It's the cares of this world. First John 2.15 says, do not love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its lust and desires. And so a Christian is someone who's been given a heart that is not in love with the things of this world. And the things of this world, as we talked about last week, constitute themselves not only in false religion and self-righteousness, but also in blatant immorality. It's both. It is the white devil and the black devil. It's the obvious and the not so obvious, the more subtle, the religious sins. And what causes this person to fall away is the fact that he's still in love with the world. He's not been given a new heart. He's not been born again. And so he departs. He's still in love with his false Christianity that he used to profess before he came to the true church of God. And so he leaves the true church of God and goes back into false religion and demonstrates himself to be false because he didn't know it was such a lonely place. He didn't know uh, there were so few who believed this. Or he, he gives in to peer pressure from those whom he was formerly acquainted with, and he demonstrates that he's false. Or whatever the case may be. In the book of Hebrews, it was that case that he was appealing to his um, readers not to return to, not to go back up into the temple 
not to go back into Ju Judaism, not to go back into, uh, not to import the old covenant into the new and create a false uh, works-based Christianity like he's talking about to the people in Galatians, not to receive circumcision, not to receive the sign of the old covenant because this is the new covenant. This is grace. This is not works. There is a distinction. You have been caused to, as we talked about last week, to hate your former manner of life, to count it as dung when you were converted. And so then finally in this parable, we have the good soul here. We have the one who hears the word and he understands it, which means he's been given faith. And then he bears fruit, which means what? Which means that his faith is not a dead faith, but it is an alive faith. It means that he acts on the things that he believes. He doesn't just give creedal confession to this and then go live how he's been living in his life. He says he believes this and he acts on it. We know James tells us that faith that without works is dead. In a few passages before we go to the parable of the wheat and the tares, um, you know, this was so in not just the church in uh, Israel or those that he's writing to in Hebrews, but it was so in numerous churches in the New Testament. And if it was so then, we know that it will be so today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to... <coughs> not to receive the grace of God in vain. So Paul appeals to those in Corinth not to receive the grace of God in vain. And so this is a concern of the apostles, that there be no one amongst them falling short of the promise, that there be no one amongst them apostatizing and departing from the faith. Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4 Paul said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen fallen from grace and so there in that passage we see that there we know the false gospel in the churches in the Galatian region was circumcision plus the addition of circumcision plus Jesus Christ and what he had done but nevertheless they were adding conditions to the new covenant they were trying to import aspects of the old covenant into the new covenant and we see Paul addresses people in the Galatian churches who had not yet received circumcision. And if they hadn't received circumcision yet, that means they hadn't departed from the truth yet because a part of the false gospel that was in those churches was the fact that they had to be circumcised and protect to themselves self the old covenant. It's sort of like Messianic Judaism today. Messianic Judaism tries to import the Old Covenant into the New, and they're not the same. I mean, we see that in the prophetic passage about the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, when he says, Days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, not like that covenant. He, he tells us it's not the same. They're completely antithetical to one another. One is of works, and the other is of grace. And we, we said the purpose for that was so that Christ could come and fulfill the covenant of works, and then through his fulfillment of the covenant of works, we receive in the covenant of grace the benefits of the covenant of works. But the point that I'm drawing out here in Galatians 5 is that those who received circumcision and demonstrated that they had believed the false gospel show that Christ is of no benefit to them. Meaning that they demonstrated they were not regenerate. They were not regenerate. They were not born again. They're demonstrating belief in a false gospel. Now, does that necessarily mean that they are bad soul hearers? 
is everybody in the church that demonstrates that they're not a believer in the gospel necessarily a reprobate bad soul hearer? We know that some are, and and the different, but some are not, as as we're going to see in this parable of the wheat and the tares. There's a distinction. There's something that happens in the church where false converts are produced, but those false converts are not necessarily apostates. Now, apostasy, what apostasy means is that you depart from what you once professed. You depart from what you once professed. Now, that's evident in the parable of the soils. You have the thorny ground here and the stony ground here and the seed and the good ground here and the seed is the same to every one of them which means the gospel is the same to every one of them and they make a profession but there's only one that abides and then two depart and they leave the truth and they demonstrate that they're reprobate and that's true apostasy so apost true apostasy demonstrates reprobation. It demonstrates that you are a bad soul here and it demonstrates that to the congregation. But nevertheless, there's something that occurs in the church according to Christ in the parable of the wheat and the tares that produces a not necessarily a apostate, but a false convert. So we'll read in Ma back in Matthew 13 and... Um, it says, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and to gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you, are, you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. All right, so, and then we'll go to down to verse 37 at the explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it says, He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be welling and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we see he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. And we know that the seed, according uh, to the parable of the soils, is the word of God is the word of God. And here we have two different seeds. The seed is different. You have the seed of the son of man and you have the seed of the enemy who is the devil. And both produce two different crops, wheat and tare. Those are two different crops that look the same. But nevertheless, they're different. And why are they different? Because they have a different seed. They have a different seed, which means they have a different gospel. And so within the context of the church, 
there will be those who come and preach a false gospel. There will possibly be those who come and preach a false gospel who are set up as teachers by the church, who infiltrate, who come in subtly, and they proclaim falsehood. And so what these tares have ultimately made a profession in is not the truth. They've ultimately made a profession in the false gospel. And then just by common sense and knowing what the scripture testifies about man, even if the truth is proclaimed, people could say they believe the truth, just like generally speaking. And nevertheless, they could contrive in their mind that the truth really means this and not this. And really in their mind, they're making a profession in a false gospel and not the truth. And I think that's the case that we're going to find in Acts chapter 8 of an example of someone who came in the church, made a profession, but nevertheless, he was false. He was, he was baptized by the disciples. Nevertheless, he demonstrated that he was not of God, but he was of the devil. And Peter's reaction to him is not, he's reprobate, he's committed the sin leading to death, as it talks about in 1 John chapter 5, therefore let's not pray for him. Peter doesn't say that. Peter doesn't apply the parable of the soils to Simon the sorcerer. Peter applies the parable of the wheat and the tares to Simon the sorcerer and understands that Simon has not understood the gospel aright, even though he's made a profession. And Peter tells Simon, as we're going to see, that he, he should pray that he, he, would, he should be forgiven. In Acts chapter 8, verse 9, Luke writes, But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had uh, fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So what I want to draw from this passage is the fact that Simon the sorcerer makes a profession. He's baptized. And then he sees that the Holy Spirit 
is given by the laying on of hands. And what does he think to himself? He thinks, I'll offer, I, I will offer them money that I may have this power also. And what does Peter say? He says, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. In other words, you don't believe the gospel? You think the Holy Spirit can come to you by money? You think that that which is bestowed by God's grace and unmerited favor can come to you through that which perishes? Through monetary possession? He tells him to repent of his wickedness and to pray if perhaps the thought of his heart may be forgiven him. He tells him that his um, his heart is not right in the sight of God. He has not been born again. But nevertheless, he tells him to pray for forgiveness. Now, if Peter had judged Simon to be reprobate, would Peter pray for Simon to be forgiven or tell, tell Simon to pray for forgiveness? No, because forgiveness would be an impossibility. Simon would have committed the sin leading to death. He would have apostatized. He would have demonstrated himself to be reprobate. But that's not what Simon is doing here. What Simon is doing here is he's showing that he's a tear. He's demonstrating that he is a tear and not wheat. He's demonstrating that he had made a profession and false seed, that he had not believed the gospel aright. And so Peter corrects his understanding of the gospel. And he tells him, you thought that you could purchase the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of this, your wickedness. What was his wickedness? Thinking that the gift of God could be obtained with money? It was false doctrine. It's the fact that he had believed a false gospel. He had contrived in his heart to understand the gospel wrongly that he was initially told. And in his heart, he had made a profession in falsehood and not the truth. He had not understood the truth or right. And he is demonstrating himself to be a tear and not a wheat. But nevertheless, he was not demonstrating himself to be reprobate. And so within the context of the church, you will have those that apostatize and commit the sin leading to death that understand what they've been told and make a profession in what they've been told. And then they demonstrate that they are reprobate, that they are bad soil hearers. And then you will also have those in the church who through some way or another make a profession in a false gospel. And they demonstrate that they are tares and not wheat. They demonstrate that they are false converts and not apostates. They demonstrate that they're no different than somebody over in Buddhism or Islam or any other false religion. <coughs> They've just somehow contrived that their false religion that they're professing somehow fits what they're being told within the church. Or maybe there's a false teacher in the church who's preached a false gospel. And for whatever reason, he's went unnoticed to those who are true and left unreproved, left unrebuked. And that person has made a profession in that false gospel that that man has preached. But nevertheless, he's, he's demonstrating himself to be a false convert instead of a reprobate. And so there is that distinction within the church. Um, and I think we see that another place that we see this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We see that this man, many people think this man was converted. But the language of the text is quite plain that this man is unregenerate. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Then a man has his father's wife. So this man has his father's wife. It doesn't say he had her on one occasion. He has her. He's taken her 
to be his wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, I have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan, which means put him out of the church, for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now Christians, we know according to Galatians, have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. Same author, right into Galatians, the Apostle Paul. And so something that is objectively true about Christians in regeneration is that they have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. Now people are going to rail against that and say, my flesh is not crucified. Well, then you're not a Christian, according to the language of Galatians. That's what Paul writes. In regeneration, we have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. And Paul says, knowing that doctrine, to deliver such a one to Satan, to put him out of the church, for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if the man's already converted, he's going to be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the point is, is put him out. What is the purpose of putting him out? What is the purpose of delivering such a one to Satan? Well, what is the church? It is the fellowship of the saints. If he's in the church, he thinks he has fellowship with the saints. He thinks that he's okay with God. He thinks that he's right with God, and that gives him a false security. That gives him a false peace. So put him out that he might see that he is not right with God, like Peter told Simon the sorcerer, that he might see that he his flesh has not been crucified along with its passions and desires. Because this man thought that the gospel was compatible with lawlessness, because the man is living with his father's wife. The man has his father's wife. This man is an adulterer. This man is sexually immoral. This man has not been converted and given a new heart. <clears throat> he says, your glorying is not good. Do, not, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. He's calling the man leaven. Are believers in Christ leaven? No, we are an unleavened lump. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the leaven, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or with us extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company. What does it mean to have company? It means to have fellowship. You extend fellowship to these people. Now if this man was a believer in the gospel, and he just needed to be exhorted to repentance, would I remove fellowship from that man? No, I still extend fellowship to my brothers even when they are in sin and they need to be disciplined and they need to repent. But Paul writes as an instructive to this church not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner not even to eat with such a person. And we know that within the first century church, one of the most basic practices that they had when they had fellowship with someone is to sit at table and to dine with them. And so he's saying, remove fellowship from anyone that's named a brother who is this, because we know that Christ saves us from being numbered amongst the world. We know that true believers are those who have been bought and justified, and are being sanctified and set apart by God the Holy Spirit, and being caused to be made more like Christ. 
They are being conformed. They are being transformed into the image of Christ day by day. He says in verse 12, For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, and he cites the penal passage of the law, and he says, put away from yourselves the evil person. Are Christians considered in scripture evil people? No, we're not never described that way. And how can the death penalty, which is what Paul is citing from the Old Covenant, he is citing the Old Covenant death penalty passages, how can that be applied to believers? This man is not being put out as a believer. He's being put out as an unbeliever. He has contrived in his heart to believe a false gospel. And by putting him out, it is declaring to him that having his father's wife, which we described as not just committing adultery, but this man is an adulterer. There is a vast difference in between Christians who have been given the Holy Spirit of God, who Christ prayed for them that they would be sanctified by the truth, who Paul wrote to Titus in Titus chapter 2, and he said that Christ purified for himself a people zealous for good works, a part of the death of Christ, Paul writes to Titus, is that Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, is that effective or not? Does Christ's work accomplish that as well or not? I don't hear anyone announcing that. Christ's work saves us completely. His death justifies us. And I'm as righteous as I'm ever going to be in the sight of God through imputed righteousness, through the imputed righteousness of Christ. God looks at me. He no longer sees me. He sees Christ. Yet, there is a practical aspect that does not play a role in my acceptance before God. But it is applied to me as someone who has been born again by the Holy Spirit, that Christ accomplished on the cross, and he sends his Spirit to purify his people and to cause them to be zealous for good works. And so there is a vast difference in between people who are practicing adulterers and fornicators and extortioners and liars and thieves and and murderers, people who, who, I mean, let's draw a distinction. Someone who is a homosexual, who is married by the state today to another man or another woman, and who has adopted children, and who is living in this homosexual practice. These people are these things. Versus Christians who have been given the Holy Spirit of God who works in them to will and to do to his good pleasure to cause them to be more like Christ day by day. There's a difference in them. And the gospel won that for his people. That his people would no longer remain totally depraved. This man in Corinth was one who would, you, you could say, that Paul was addressing in Romans chapter 6, who would say, let us sin that grace might abound. In other words, he had no desire for righteousness. He was living it up in his total depravity. He was not converted, and that's why. Because he could, he, he thought grace was a license to sin. Paul says, put him out. Put him out. He has no lot or portion in this matter. He's not converted. He hasn't believed the truth. Licentiousness and grace are not compatible. Grace instructs us to renounce unrighteousness. Was this man being instructed by grace to renounce unrighteousness? 
And so this man was demonstrated to be unregenerate. He was demonstrated to be a tear. He had never made true profession in the true gospel. And Paul says, put him out. And then later on in 2 Corinthians, we have reason to believe that God used this as a means to convert him and grant him true repentance leading to life. And so that is the difference in between apostasy and false conversion. And so getting back to the book of Hebrews, when he says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. <clears throat> and so you could come short of God's rest in both of those ways, through apostasy and departure from the truth, or false conversion, that you've made a profession in a false gospel and not understood the gospel rightly. And Paul says, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So what better way to fear God? Lest any of you seem to have come short of entering God's rest than to declare and let it be made known the truth of the fulfilled promise that we mentioned earlier. That God sent forth his son into this world, born of a virgin, born under the law that was given to the nation of Israel as a covenant of works. That said, do this and live. And what were the requirements of that law? But perfect obedience. Never missing a beat. Never missing a second. And so Christ did it. Every intention of the thoughts of the Messiah's heart were only righteous continually. He perfectly served God. The heavens opened up and God the Father declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was the spotless Lamb of God without blemish. He was unleavened bread. He was without spot or wrinkle or defect. He was examined. And he was found guiltless. He never transgressed the holy law of God. He perfectly kept it because he was the word incarnate. The law was written. Because the law testifies to us about God's character. God is not a liar. God is not a thief. God is not a murderer. He's not a blasphemer. He is not an idolater. He loves himself. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit loves the Father. The Son loves the Spirit. God as Trinity loves himself. God does everything for himself. For his own glory. To make known who he is. And Jesus Christ did all things on earth to glorify God. He loved God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself. And yet when he went to the cross, God the Father imputed, he charged, he reckoned, all of the sin of God's elect unto the Son. All of those that God had eternally loved, God took their sin and he imputed it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, so that the one who was holy, righteous, and undefiled, when God looked at him, he no longer took him into view, but he saw the sin of his people. He saw the self-righteousness of his people. He saw the theft of his people. He saw the murder of his people. He saw the adultery of his people, the idolatry, the blasphemy. Everything that we are, not just what we commit, but who we are in our inward parts. That which is a maggot that God calls vile and putrid. 
was laid to the account of the Son of God. And when God beheld that, he poured out his wrath on his Son as he hung on that tree as an offering for sin. He crushed Jesus Christ under the wrath of God. God the Father forsook the Son. Jesus Christ cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus Christ was treated how the elect of God should be treated for an eternity in hell. And he proved that he satisfied God's wrath by raising again from the dead three days later. Meaning he did what God gave him to do. The work that he was given to do in coming into the world, he did it. He accomplished it. He finished it. He said as much on the cross when he said, it is finished. Meaning paid in full. Everything that you and I, those who believe the gospel, the elect of God who are yet to believe the gospel, everything that we owe to the justice of God, Christ paid it all. He finished it all. And he rose from the dead. He got up in a glorified body, a body that would never see sickness or tiredness or any, anything that is an effect of the fall of Adam whereby God cursed this creation. That body will never taste any of the pains of death again. And you and I will partake of a glorified body in the resurrection. That is our hope. He accomplished that hope for us. That hope is based on what he did, that he lived righteously under the law, keeping all of its demands, and he became a curse under that law through having sin imputed to him. And then he satisfied that curse, the wrath of God, through the power of his indestructible life and raised from the dead so that those who believe in him will be raised to newness of life. That is our hope. It is all based on what he did, that the work is finished. Do you believe that work? This morning, is that your confidence? The Bible tells you to repent and to believe this gospel, this good news, the report of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And yet the Bible also tells us that without being born again, you will never believe that good news, that your heart is completely set on justifying yourself before God. Thinking that you can meet a condition to be accepted. Faith is not a condition for acceptance. Faith, as we said earlier, is the, uh, the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. That means you can't muster up faith in your own strength and so be accepted because you've made the right choice. That's not what this is about. This is about Christ accomplishing a work, saving a people through his life and death, proving that it's satisfactory, and then he sends his spirit to those that he died for in time to apply this work to them through giving them faith and imputing to them Christ's righteousness so that when God looks at you he no longer sees you anymore but he sees the son he no longer requires anything at your hand anymore because the son paid it in full that's double imputation if you are a child of God God has taken your sin and he has imputed it to Christ he has charged it to Christ 2,000 years ago, he has poured out the wrath of God that you deserve to experience in hell on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has put that sin away as far as the east is from the west. 
So far has he moved, removed your transgressions from you. He has provided complete covering for your sin. Objectively speaking. And you don't do anything to get it. He extends it to those that it was done for. Those that the Father gave him. The elect of God. Those who have been eternally loved of God. Do you believe this? Have you been made to believe this? Has God given you a new heart to believe this? This is what must occur. When you hear this message, when you hear what Jesus Christ has done, that God gave him, even when his people were yet enemies, that God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. For verily will a good man, will one dare to die, perhaps even a righteous man, one would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. I know I didn't say that perfectly, but the point is, is that that is the love of God. While we hated God, while we were running as far as we could away from God, Christ died. What does that do to your heart? Does it just remain like stone and you're unfazed by it? When you hear of the love of God, of what Christ did, does that move you to believe in him? To put your confidence in Him. Does it cause you to see that there's nothing good in you at all that can merit God's favor? Your faith can't merit God's favor. Your repenting can't merit God's favor. Your doing good deeds cannot merit God's favor. Only Christ can merit the favor of God. Is He your hope? Is he your hope that one day you'll stand in the resurrection? Do you long to see him? Don't put confidence in yourself. Your confidence must be Christ alone. And then knowing that, knowing that confidence, that motivates the Christian to do good works. That motivates the Christian to love God and neighbor. Not to seek to earn righteousness because of it, but because we've first been loved by him. We love him because he first loved us. And knowing that love, it motivates us and compels us to righteousness. Not a righteousness that justifies, but a righteousness that is Christ-likeness. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And so a true love of God is produced in God's people by the Holy Spirit. And it's motivated and compelled by what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for a new heart. We thank you, Lord, for preserving your church. We thank you for um, each other. We pray that you would add to the number. We pray that you would convert all of the elect. Indeed, we know that the Apostle Paul said that for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. Pray that you would grant, grant a great love in us for the brethren, even those who are not converted yet, that we would go forth and tell others the good news of what you have done in the world. Lord, we desire that you would come soon 
and that you would make a new heavens and a new earth. That you would raise the dead. That we would sit beside of you, that we would stand, that we would judge the nations with you in one accordance with your judgment. Lord, we pray. We pray that you would, through what has been preached, through your word, that you would expose those who have believed falsehood. Indeed, we know that we believe falsehood for a great part of our lives. The worst part of believing falsehood is that you think that you're right in believing it. And so it's deception. We pray that we would be a people who let God be true and every man be a liar. That is the desire of our heart. Pray that you would reprove us in any error we might have. That you would give us correction through your word and your spirit's power. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.